Welcome to Inspiration and Adaptation, a weekly program to explore Alaskan artists' adaptations and innovations in pandemic times, planetary stress, social justice movement, and um, economic challenge. We're so happy to have you with us today, Holly, coming to us from Anchorage and here, Benel broadcasts inspiration and adaptation from Homer. At the moment, I'm actually on Yurok land in Northern California, and Benel is on the tribal lands of Ninilchik village, tribal lands that stretch from the Caribou Hills across to Katnu to the tip of Homer Spit and um, all the way up to um, Kenai region. We, um, we are really pleased at Benel to partner with indigenous artists to um, support efforts of um, decolonization. And these weekly dialogues um, are a really important part of that. We're so pleased to have Holly Nordlin with us today. Artist Holly um, Mituk Nordlin speaks about cultural resistance and revitalization today through her present projects, including public art, land acknowledgement through art, film and traditional tattoo. Holly received a Bachelor of Fine Art in, in Graphic Design and Photography from the University of Alaska Anchorage. Nordland's public art can be seen at Cook Inlet Housing Authority on Spinard and 36th and at the Lusak Library facade with pending projects at the Mountain View School Alaska Cares Building. In 2016, Nordland was named a Time Warner Fellow with the Sundance Film Festival and received an Art Matters Grant and a Humanities Forum Grant for her work documenting Tupuk Mi, traditional Inuit tattoo. She was also featured in New York Times Lifestyle section in the summer of 2018, and she's been awarded an Alaska Native Visionary Award, a Rasmussen Individual Artist Award, and she was named Smithsonian's National Museum of the Year Indian Artist Leadership Program. Congratulations, Holly. You have an extraordinary record of achievement already as, um, as a young artist in Alaska. It's, it's truly impressive, and we're delighted to have you with us today. Thanks. It sounds like a long list, but um, when you work for a long time, 20 years almost, crazy, um, you just rack up these little things. <laughs> and you know, you have you. I think you have kind of um, an amazing story, which you know your art, um, in some ways, um, transforms and transcends at a pretty high level. There are so many questions that I have for you today, and I hope you'll let me know if there's anything that you or any area that you don't really want to talk about. But one of the things which I became aware of um, and most moved by when you had work in our uh, nationally touring show, Decolonizing Alaska, is your fearlessness in reaching into your own story and the stories of, I would say, resilience and um, compassion and courage, um, overcoming experiences that um, are not totally unique in Alaska, but truly reflect the impacts of colonization. I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about your childhood and, and how it might have shaped you to make you the artist that you are today. Oh, interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, my parents are Roger and Lucy Nordlam. First, Uvanga Atega Metitko, Kikik Tarumi Runga. My name is Holly Nordlam. Mititkok is my Inupak name. And um, I'm originally from Kotzebue, Alaska, or Kikik Dagrok. And um, growing up there, my parents were, my mom's from Kotzebue originally and is the Inupak. And um, my dad is Norway, Norwegian and German from, um, from Minnesota. So he was up there flying and um, they met. Then my mom actually had signed up to go to AIAI. She was like 21 when uh, they met and she- uh, She was gonna go to the Institute of American Indian Art? She was. Wow. And then uh, I happened. <laughs> so it must've been really strong on her mind to have to give that up uh, for me. Um, but I think that's, uh, that was a benefit to me, you know, that 
she's always been an artist and she's an amazing drawer and can visualize much more than I can. And I think her and I had an uncle who was an artist. Um, they kind of led that for me. However, they were both dog mushers, my parents. So they were, I did rod mushers and both did really well in the, I did rod in the eighties. And um, that kind of formed my life. We were always living um, out in the boonies, you know, without running water, honey buckets, hunting for food. I remember as a little, little girl, my mom had a trap line and she would ski and check her traps. And um, once in a great while we were so little, she let us come with. And um, those kind of just form your, the way you're independent, the way you're able to survive um, in such a cold climate. And this is outside of Kotzebue, right? 30 miles from Kotzebue. So we weren't even near the town for a lot of my little uh, youth. Of course, then I had to go to school <laughs> and then we moved to town so I could go to school. But I think all that kind of formed, you know, them being artists, my mom being an artist, and then um, being in the Arctic um, at what is normally called fish camp, but it was our full year thing. And then my grandparents lived out there too, about five miles from us. And they were Inupak speakers and often spoke Inupak um, when I, you know, to tell, to gossip or to say something about me. So um, my Inupak was always like, on, you know, when they were talking in Inupak, I wanted to know, what are they talking about? Are they talking about me? Are they gossiping? You know, so I had a real interest in language even then because uh, they were my regular babysitters. I actually had never been around strangers until kindergarten. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you see my dad. You know, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> right here working on, I think he's repairing the bathroom toilet. Um, so just, you know, all very um, kind of family oriented, it sounds like the way that you were raised and you were you were immersed in wanting to learn your language early on, which is pretty right. Special. And, and yeah. it's funny that it was um, done in a way that it was excluded from me, right? Like I wanted it, but they weren't teaching it to me. I was just like, what are they saying? And, and we all know that's a great way to motivate kids. It's to want to, like, so good. So good. Yeah. And even though I, um, I don't, like I'm, I'm in my 40s now and I don't think I remember any of that language. When I was in Greenland, it was all coming flooding back. So those neurotransmitters that were early, you know, with language, um, they're in there. And that's pretty amazing with the human brain, what it can do. Yeah, I've had that, that experience as well. And so it's, it's a combination of the desire and the exposure and the conditions that exactly. you, you know that you find yourself in. So you noticed similarities between Greenlandic Inuit language. And it's the exact language, except the dialectical differences. Wow. So um, they may use the same word for something else, right? Um, over time, you know how language grows. Yeah. So. Over, um, they may use the same word for something else, but it's the same core word. So I was, I was like, what did you just say? You know, um, and what's really cool about Greenland is you're a lot of people in the smaller villages don't speak English. They don't have English teachers. So um, you're desperate to communicate. And um, that is an amazing learning tool. <laughs> well, you were in Greenland how many years ago now? two maybe three mm -hmm. um, um my covid has messed with my timeline significantly right. but i maybe three, three and at that point is that when you were studying um tattoo yeah we're always studying tattoo but this was right after we started tattooing yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah about a year into our practice and at that point did you have a really specific um like uh program or apprenticeships that you were doing or were you working more independently in that um, research? And well, I mean, like you hope apprenticeships go on forever, right? Like you hope that you learn 
you get to a point where you're at the same level and then you, you start learning together, um, you and your people. Um, and I, I was still learning then and I'm still learning now. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the we of this project that you're referencing and oh, okay. also the teachers that were really important to you. Yeah. Uh, oh, I could go on and on about how lucky we were. First, um, Yari Walker really inspired me. She uh, works at the Heritage Center and does so much education for Native people here in the city, in, in schools and in conferences. She's just a powerhouse of education. And I worked with her years ago and she told me a little bit about her story about her tattoos. And um, she, uh, the guy who did her tattoos, who was in his twenties at the time, a Western tattooer, um, became our first like partner, uh, Jake Scrivener. Mm -hmm. And um, he just is so caring and giving. He was able to, you know, help me through this process first. Uh, we got funding from uh, the Polar Lab, and that was uh, with the help of Don Biddison helping me write out a plan, how we were going to structure, Museum. yeah, at the Anchorage Museum, and, and that was Don helping me plan it, she's amazing, uh, I have so many people to think, but, and then Jake uh, helped me kind of figure out what, what an apprenticeship and would look like, and over the years, we discussed many things, and he's still a huge resource for us. Um, but uh, before I even had anyone to train us, I had kind of dreamed of an Inuit woman to train us, right? Uh, Inuit tattooing was women for women. So once I got the funding, I just kind of sat on it and hoped and kept reaching out to people and hoped there was someone out there. Um, and then Stephen Blanchett was living in Denmark at the time, and he came back for a performance and we went out for a drink and he said, I met someone, an Inuit woman working in Norway who's doing traditional tattoos. And I, it just, what? Like I got tingles and was so excited. So he hooked us up right there uh, on Facebook <laughs> uh, with Maya, uh, Maya Jacobson. And um, yeah, then I was able to start planning once we found somebody and convince her to do this with us. And, um, and having met Maya, and I know she's such a lovely, charismatic woman. You know, I remember when she came to Bunnell Street Art Center, she brought this beautiful presentation about tattoo and she showed her own drawings that kind of expressed um, history, you know, about their use. And I wonder if, you know, through your lens and your experience, you could tell us about um, the role of traditional tattoo in, in marking like significant points in a woman's life. What, is it, what does it mean, you know, historically to be? Um, I mean, I, I always go back to like, we have to reimagine life, right? Like we live this kind of life now, but life back then wasn't like this. It was uh, survival and hunting and subs all subsistence, right? And the, the women um, were responsible for keeping people fed and then, you know, clothing everybody. So imagine having to sew your kids clothes and he rips them and you have to sew them every other day, you know, like, mm -hmm. Um, and then tanning furs, all that was the woman's responsibility. Uh, obviously, everybody contributes to that process, but um, keeping that in mind that life was very different. Mm -hmm. Like, um, But um, I have seen stories, many stories about um, when the men were out hunting for months at a time or a month at a time that the uh, women would be sewing and, and, and that's when the tattooing happened it is when they were together and you know surviving and and trying to make the best of the situation that they were in and then yes the tattoos uh were done to recognize things in their lives that were accomplishments or things they were good at or you know just a celebration of their life but the first i think maya talks about this too the first markings were often done when a girl became a woman which you know she started her cycle so mm -hmm. um 
then it was a marker and a celebration of her becoming a woman. And I, I think about that a lot because um, I don't know your story, but my story was like of shame, right? Like mm. I, I didn't even know what was going on. I, I think I was nine, 10 years old. And I, you just don't know uh, yeah. when you start your, your period in your cycle. Um, had it been a celebration of community and becoming a woman, oh my goodness, that would have made a, uh, a significant but it wasn't looked on that way for me. Yeah. And I love that idea of um, taking something that uh, has become shameful because of colonization, I believe, um, and making it a celebration. I think it ties right into, <laughs> I, mean, I know where you're going. I think it ties right into the sexuality of Native women as well, because mm -hmm. it's, it's shameful, you know, and, and that's been put upon us. Um, by our colonizer. And when you spoke of the shame of, of um, starting your cycle, the shame in the context of, a, of a, a colonized environment, tell me a little bit more about what that that moment was like then. In that, yeah, in I mean, I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh -huh. My great grandmother um, is kind of that that generation and she I, I'm trying to think of the year I'm right at the turn you know 1900 yeah like 20 30 years on both sides um so Inupac speaker lived in a sod house and um you know uh was the last in our family had to have traditional face tattoo the tablet and the chin tattoo and I think that time um, I th I just quoted Ernestine Hayes the other day because I love her so much. But um, in her book, uh, Cow of Raven, she speaks about imagine, let's say, this American society and for lack of a better community, let's say Russia takes us over tomorrow and or they buy us. Um, and we have to learn their language. We've never heard it before. We have to learn their money system. We've never seen it before. We have to learn their social structure and we've never seen that before. And then we have to work at jobs we've never done before. And that's kind of exactly what that was like for them, right? The confusion and the not knowing and, and, and wanting the best for your children, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what that was like for that generation. Um, and then wanting to conform, they may, you know, when you put, I, and I tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the Seward's agreement that's kind of split up Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, so they had religious leaders there and they just circled areas, right? Quakers, you got cots of you in the surrounding area. And uh, Nome is a Catholic church. And, you know, down here, we're going to have Russian Orthodox. and then they put those religious factions in places of power, right? They ran the towns, they ran any educational. Yeah. And, and that comes, I mean, when you're switching from a system that you've known for thousands of years and then to this new system, it creates a lot of confusion and loss. And, um, and then you want what's best for your kids. So you're just trying to make it, right? So a lot of my aunts and uncles don't don't speak any back and uh, weren't encouraged to. And then we're raised in boarding schools because then the state of Alaska did a really interesting thing and they uh, made it illegal for kids not to go to school. So you had to either send them away or move with them. And nobody could really do that. So um, and then later, of course, there was a court case that um, made them build schools in the villages, but that came much later. So there's a whole generation of people had, that had to go to boarding school. So you're speaking about like, in a sense, these way, these layers of colonization beginning exactly. with the religious colonization, which brought shame in. Exactly. And you yeah. know, all those boarding schools were religious. Like yeah. it was, it's a real tool. And, and, and it was just picked like you Quaker, you, 
you know there was no free will there was no free will Mm -hmm. it was uh, forced upon us and then their ways are very different than our ways so um there's shame comes with that when you're changing over yeah they want i mean it's kind of a tool shame is a tool to Mm -hmm. help you to make you conform and then you had the the shaming around language and loss of language exactly so in this context your this revitalization of traditional tattoo it it means something about overcoming that certainly but what right. else does it mean for you and for the women who um come to you for a tattoo today they're yeah. you know they've survived an another stage a different wave the contemporary impacts of colonization what sort of things are you hearing that are motivating this this really um, powerful marking and signifier of identity right well and i think um the chin tattoo is the most obvious but we have them all over the body and um I like to call those other ones uh, gateway tattoos because you know, the face is where it's going to go. Like this yeah. makes the real impact in society. Sure. To wear it on your face. To wear it on your face. Um, but uh, to your question, which now I'm trying to remember. Now those remember. other, those, those other moments, the symbolism. Of oh, the like now. Yes. Yeah. So now I think it's so interesting because it is in this time, I mean, we just got out of this tough, tough time uh, politically, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, that really showed true colors here and even here in our society, right? All over the country and, um, you know, racism, um, more shame, all those things were so obvious over these last five years. I mean, they, they've always been obvious, but uh, they were emboldened these last four years. And some people call that, you know, white body supremacy. Right? Yes. It's that yes. privileging of the white body. And yes. The shaming and controlling of brown and black bodies. And exactly. Bodies so when you talk about, you know, like, in a sense, emboldening that, you know, your body, women's bodies, bodies of color. It's really like claiming exactly this, this body and saying, I'll do it. When I always say in their face in right in front of them, right? It's a direct, um, and they look at it as an assault, but I, I look at it as a reminder, Mm -hmm. right? A reminder. Yeah. We're still here and you didn't get rid of us because colonization really was to get rid of us, right? To Mm -hmm. take our resources and not have to deal. And I still feel like that. I still feel like we walk around having, they're like, oh, here we go. You know, we have to deal with this native issue. And so, I- Well, what about just for a moment there, I'm thinking about um, invisibility. That's part of colonization. It's a systematic, you know, breeding out and a gradual erasure of traditions, whether it starts with exactly you know, how we feel about our bodies and the rituals associated with coming of age to language and then eventually skin and appearance. Right. Exactly. Right? Yes. And you exist, you exist between worlds, right? Or the yes. meaning of worlds. Well, and I wonder, I mean, for my own thing, I wonder if I got them so that I knew who, like when I look in the mirror, I know who yeah. I am. Yes. Uh, and, and then uh, to tell other people, this is who I am, you know, and I think that's what it is now uh, for contemporary women. Yeah. It's a celebration. It also gives them a way to heal from traumas. And that's something we're working with Allison Kelleher, um, who's a tribal healer, but also a medical doctor. She's amazing. And she's been sitting with Sarah and I, Sarah lives here in town, one of our, uh, my co-apprentices. And um, teaching us about how to help because the process is really quiet you know the tattooing process is so quiet there's no machine between us it's just me and another person and um, we can talk we can laugh we can cry the way through it right so and and what are your tools as you're doing that that are so quiet um i make a little harpoon uh, for each client and and that's and then of course skin stitching is just a needle and thread Mm -hmm. so it's very very quiet process and you have a lot of opportunity when you open up the skin. 
often people open up their hearts and their yeah. uh, tell their story. So we've been working with Allison to how to help as much as we can, but also to protect ourselves, right? Because we don't want to get too far, excuse me, into their, you know, take on their pain. We want to help as much as we can and, and then be able to help the next person. So um, Alice has been amazing in helping us learn how to do that, uh, teaching us about touch and uh, just what we can do uh, from a to help. You know, from a traditional perspective, when you think about touch and what can you do, what what's really different that you that you're noticing from from the framework that Allison is bringing to what you had thought of or been aware of as more what you might say more Western or colonial. Right. Inner. Well, I think I I think in my own personal struggle with it, like I I was bought into the system. It's taken me a while to kind of step away and and even recognize spirituality and that our ancestors are with us like that's hard for me to even verbalize now but um but i know that's that's real now which um in the past i was so cynical right um, when you're when you're oppressed and you see your people oppressed and you see racism and constantly you get so cynical yeah. And to open that back up, open up your heart to these ideas is, a, has been a real challenge, but, um, a rewarding one. Um, yeah. So tell me, you know, like the tattooing fits into this bigger story of yourself making visible acts and making visible, um, indigenous identity around right. Anchorage, especially the biggest, right. they say the biggest village in Alaska. The biggest native village in Alaska. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I love that. But um, before COVID, we were traveling to the other, to other villages quite a bit, as much as we could, um, and working with communities and um, educating. And um, it's so fulfilling and it's so wonderful. Um, How do you balance that with like these big, you know, public art projects that you're doing? You've got... Well, you I think know, COVID it was a... <laughs> <laughs> COVID helps um, because I've just been stuck, right? We haven't been able to travel for almost a year and um, I've been able to focus on public art. However, um, public art's a, a funny thing. It, it pays well, which is really great. And then um, it all happens at once. Like you do a proposal and that takes some time. Then there's many months, sometimes a year, and then you, you get it done. So it isn't a it isn't a hands-on all the time process. Um, I also do graphics, right, to pay my bills. So um, mm -hmm. I'm able to do that um, as well as tattoo. So the biggest thing is my schedule. Like I, yeah. I just have to schedule. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm not always good about scheduling uh, time for other things. Um, but luckily, you know, COVID really slowed things down, so. I've been able to really think about what I want to do, where we want to go, um, how we want to do it. Um, Is that a big change for you? Just like at this time, having this kind of time out time to really it, think. Absolutely. It's been hard, actually. Um, I've always suffered with a little depression, but like it's been tough being yeah. here. Like This is my space, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's been uh tough and um, struggling with getting up every day and you know getting out of the house every day mm -hmm. I mean I'm lucky I have a puppy and an old dog and they make me go out into the wilderness every day and um, that has been a lifesaver like if I wasn't doing that every day I I don't know it'd be really tough yeah um, I, I feel you I, I'm struggling with that too and I'm thinking about how much it just um encourages me to just be in this space with you right now you know yes. connecting and talking about what's really going on and how it's been difficult do you think there are certain changes that you're going to really try and take with you when we as we come out of this pandemic in terms of how you're using your time and how you're thinking about your priorities i don't know i i hope so i kind of like the adhd uh 
you know, busy here, this public art here, graphic design deadline here. I kind of love that. Um, I've always loved it. So um, um, I do feel like though that my, the, the words coming out of my mouth have, uh, I've had so much time to think and um, like that will, is what will change the most in, in that it solidified these ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say, yeah, but um, kind of bringing it all together. I've listened to so many podcasts too, like educational about Black Lives Matter and how that you know, goes hand in hand with native issues and we shouldn't separate them. Like thinking about that kind of stuff and how I can support other brown people when I'm speaking about Inuit issues. Um, I'm, I, that's my biggest takeaway from the COVID sitting still for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've been reading a really interesting book by um, a meditator named Sylvia Borstein, and she has this expression, don't just do something, sit there. Yeah. Which is really hard for me to it's do. It's really hard. I have that busy gene and it distracts me and, and sometimes it it comforts me and I'm thinking exactly. while I'm doing things with my hands. Exactly. I know it's been real hard to sit, but um, I feel like with the light coming back, you know, um, I'm more positive. You know, springtime for Native people is really tough because you, the light comes back and you are, you are expected to be happier and you feel the same person. <laughs> and it, it can be really tough and our suicide rates go up really high. So speaking honestly, regularly about that issue. Um, and being okay with being really down sometimes mm -hmm. um, during this time, we're supposed to be really happy. That um, wow! I bet a fair amount of processing is happening while you're meeting with clients. Have you been able to continue your tattoo practice? I have been um, just slowly. Uh, I haven't been uh, posting about it. I let the client do that um, just because I don't want to get overwhelmed and have to say no to too many people. Yeah. But I've been very slowly, especially over COVID, I was so lucky to have people in my bubble who wanted tattoos. <laughs> so that helped a lot, kept me fresh. Um, I've also been working with my oldest son. Uh, he just turned 21 um, because we speak about um, a lot about Native men and what they need and their, their struggle. You know, and Native men have the highest rates of suicide. Um, the highest rates of incarceration, three times the national average of any other, you know, group. And um, how can we change that? And right before COVID last year, we were in Hawaii at a tattoo conference and we spent two weeks there. And something I learned over there from Keone and Nunez, who's um, the Hawaiian tattooer, is that they do things, men do things very differently. They tattoo differently. They talk to each other differently. And um, men need men to heal mm -hmm. and, and to be an example. I can mother the hell out of everybody, but they need each other. And um, that really, that whole thing in Hawaii with Julia Gray and Keone just uh, solidified that I needed to do my, more with men. And um, I had this opportunity to work with somebody who's been on the trail with me, right? <laughs> and, um, and he's amazing and lovely. So we've been working a lot together over this time. And um, he's just become quite the tattooer, just amazing. Wow. I know. Are you speaking of your son? Yeah, my son, Trevor. Yeah. He is amazing and he's just, I mean, he speaks so clearly. Um, and so honestly, and he's just an amazing kid. And he tattooed uh, Ricky the other day when Ricky was in town, Ricky Tagaban from Juno. And um, it was just like full circle. It's just lovely. It was just lovely to see so the next generation. It, it, that's what I'm thinking about is just how like in the space of one generation with your consciousness and passion and skills and availability to your son, you're creating so much change with his clarity as you put yes it, and the yes. capacity the skill that he's exactly he's and it was right because he was on this whole journey with me right he was he knew everything 
even if I didn't talk to him directly, he heard it all and he knew what we were trying to do. And um, it's almost innate now, like it's in him now. So I don't even have to do any explaining. It's, it's just powerful. And I know that Sarah's been working with her girls as well. Um, and, Are you and talking about Sarah Whalen? Yes, yeah, Sarah Lund. Whalen Lund. Yeah. And uh, we work together here. Uh, and um, yeah, she's been working with her girls. And I think that's going the same way. It just It's just so magical. You get to do this amazing thing with your kid and, and trust them um, with this knowledge and with this uh, for the next generation. I mean, Sarah and I are both in our 40s. So like, it's not like we can do it for very long. I can't be 90 and punched over a tattoo. <laughs> are you are you comfortable um, identifying as a healer, as a cultural worker who's- uh, I, I try, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm trying. Mm -hmm. I, a therapist, yes, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> like I listen to stories, like I identify with all stories, you know, um, I always say, you know, to young girls who come in to see me and we're tattooing, we can talk about serious stuff or we can just laugh. It's totally up to you. But when you do feel ready uh, to talk about the trauma that you've endured, just mm -hmm. turn to another Native girl. Like sexual, uh, it's sexual abuse is what I'm speaking of specifically, uh, some, our numbers are ridiculously high, like 90% of Native women have been sexually abused in some way. And, um, but physical abuse as well. And um, yeah, it isn't always as heavy, but I always tell people that whenever you're ready, just turn to another Native girl to speak to her. Just yesterday, Holly, I was listening to a really beautiful story in Spanish about a tattoo project in Spain that a woman who studied tattoo decided to do, which is, um, and you've probably read about this, she created this um, nonprofit that basically invites women who have been, um, who are recovering from abuse, who are survivors of trauma. Um, and sometimes that looks like, um, tattoos where a man's name is on their body to express ownership or control. And these women are trying to move forward. So they come in to have those marks of their body, you know, reinvented and to take back their body. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that idea. I've not read about that, but I love that idea. Um, it's always a bad idea to have somebody, you know, name on you <laughs> and uh yeah it's i i do i love that idea of um, reclamation and um and that's what we're doing right and that's what we're doing we're taking back we're talking about our hard stories as as we're sitting there and we're taking back some of the power and then leaving with something hopefully beautiful lately and i think it's over covid um, that I've just had a lot of time to think about how I tattoo and the, the tattoos have become more beautiful. Like lately, every one that I do, I want. <laughs> wow. I know. And I just think that's because I had a long break and now I appreciate it more. Do you feel that there's connections between the work that you're doing on the body, especially or specifically the female body and acts of, um, reclamation of acknowledgement that relate directly to land acknowledgement and the public art works, the works that you create in public space. Yeah, to... I do. I really yeah. think it's all tied, connected. Um, it's all the same work, I think. It's that reminder, right? For other people, I call them opportunists, um, to know that we're still here, that you know, we've always look, been looked on as an, as a, as a burden or a, uh, like another hurdle for them to take our resources, that we're still here and that we have a strong voice. I think it all, when I think about imagery, when I think about the tattoos, I think they're all connected in that I'm constantly just trying to remind people we're still here, that we still live here, that we um, should have more of a voice here um, because, you know, honestly, 
we're the ones who care about the land and care about the next generation. You know, like, I don't want to bring his name up, but selling of Anwar, the leases on Anwar, that is just heartbreaking. That is for the next generation and the generation after that. And um, that happened, right? Yeah. And um, the direct parallels between the um, extractive control and colonization of the land and the female body. Yes. And, and, and people speak the, about it better than I do, but I do believe it's so connected. The, the taking, right? The, the yeah. taking we've endured. And then this reclamation and, and, and demanding of recognition that we're here and, um, and our people. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, that we're people just like everybody else, I think, is a, a strong reminder and something that I think about when I'm doing public art, I'm doing graphics, when I'm doing everything that I do. And I, I hope that comes across as um, just a reminder to the other people. So making more visible the presence of Indigenous people, of Indigenous women. And, right. Um, if you think about that in terms of your sculpture, could you describe a recent project? Um, and if you'd like, you know, to share an image or to um, whatever you might like that sort of is how, how you're exploring that through a really different media. I mean, I've seen you use um, beer caps, bottle yeah, caps. I have one right behind paintings. me. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You have made some amazing big portrait work that are kind of color studies, mm -hmm. but using materials at hand. And of course, the bottle cap has a lot of um, you know, environmental and sort of sociocultural resonance as a thing, right. you know, related to um, drinking and trash and recycling and all kinds of things. Yeah, I love those pieces. Um, they're hard for me to do because they're a lot of work, but I, I do love them. And they tell the stories of my own family members. It's still an important issue. Nowadays, I tell my family who who drink too much. Like, you're the next portrait if you don't watch it. <laughs> you're so fearless. You're so courageous. How did you come by that? I, mean, I don't where know. Does, where do you the overconfidence that? of uh, of the first girl, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just, uh, being the first girl, getting all that, I had blonde curls, and right, I was a native girl with blonde curls. And wow. um I got a lot of ridiculous attention. It just gave me a lot of confidence. Um, and that, I, yeah. and being the oldest, I think you just, uh, you find your own path when you're the oldest. I think I get a lot of freedom. And, and as artists, you know, we get a lot of freedom anyway to kind of, and I, uh, who said this? He's a mask maker. He works with Alvin, um, Alvin Perry. Oh. Yeah, Perry said Perry. at a presentation we were at a few years ago, that as artists, we get all this freedom to do whatever the hell we want. Our lives can look any way we want them to. And um, that resonates with me. I mean, we but can people, you know, people don't always choose the level of, of responsibility that you do to help um, inspire and guide others forward. They might choose freedom. Do you right, know right, I mean? right, 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 right. I think, around. though, the, is, is, is a freedom mm -hmm. because I don't have to think about what I want, right? I try uh, to think about what is best for everybody in my community. And um, that's a real freedom because I don't, I don't have to think about free will. I don't have to think about stepping on people to get what I want, mm. right? Uh, that commitment is a freedom and I feel lucky. I don't think of it as a burden at all. I, I feel lucky. Um, I mean, see, I see artists trying to find their identity and I never have to worry about that. Wow. And, you know, your, um, your honesty and courage is, is so inspiring, you know, and I'm just reading some, some comments in the chat right now and, and, um, I'm glad I can't see them. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's really just the appreciation that you could acknowledge men's trauma and how important it oh. is to pay attention 
to know right. the needs as well. Right. I, I think that's so important. I mean, with our numbers, uh, I hate numbers, statistics, but it's a good, uh, it's a good gauge of where we are in society and, and uh, our men, um, anything I can do for our men, um, like train my son, this is the best mm -hmm. I can do now, but anything I can do. I also worked on that um, suicide prevention video, uh, PSA, which um, was both rewarding and it's powerful and I love it. It's the uh, heart of the land, Alaska. Um, and I ca we cast that, I cast that up in Kapatsibu in the area and it was directed toward young native men. So we were fine. We went around uh, the state and uh, with my own connections and found men already doing amazing things, young native men doing amazing things on their own. I mean, we had a skateboarder, we had a carver, we had a, uh, we had, I mean, I, my list was so long. And then of course we were shooting within this little time frame, So we had to find people who were available. So I still have a long list of young native men that I wanna do more with, right? I wanna show, do film work that shows these stories, these success stories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's something that's on my mind and has been over COVID quite a bit is how do I, uh, what's next with um, that I can do for, for, for men, for native men. Um, do you think it's a new project or will it continue to work with some of the media, film, tattoo? Yeah, I like, uh, I was just talking to David Taylor in Hawaii um, and he, we've worked together over the years and we went to UAA together and he's working on some film. And we were talking yesterday about how film is a real direct, you can make real change, right? Through humor. I mean, you could, through storytelling, it, it, you can make real change in the way people think. So um, yeah, I, I, it's a powerful tool and I still wanna to continue to use it. Mm. You're so extraordinary. Oh, stop I, it. You are no, no more, no more compliments. And wisdom, just really. <laughs> no, I, I mean, come on, show us that that's okay. To, it's to okay, keep, thank it's, you. Yeah. But again, I have the freedom of commitment to my community, right? Like that freedom of commitment uh, is, is is so freeing. I feel like I, I mean, I'm so grateful. I have that connection, and I'm able to do what I can every day, right? I have. People come in almost every day and we get to sit together and talk story and, and heal and, and laugh and cry. I mean, it's a lovely, I'm just so lucky. Well, you know, you are lucky and you're also honest about what's difficult. I wanna ask you, what do you need? What, if you could get the support of the world to lean into your mission and the kind of work that you choose to prioritize, you know, from the level of um, community pride, social justice, women's um, confidence, empowering men. What do you need to do that work? Oh boy, I wonder. You know, I work with Mike Conti a lot mm -hmm. and um, he's amazing and he's so great to work with. And um, I, I I, I would say funding, but it's not about funding us more like time. I need more time mm -hmm. to uh, do this. I need a good assistant <laughs> and I need more time. Um, I've been so lucky recently to be getting, I, I just got a Rasmussen fellowship and to be getting this recognition and um, funding. Now it's just uh, getting down to it and uh, finishing projects like our film, uh, working on new projects, which I want to do more film, even if they're low budget, just telling the tattoo stories, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I want to do more of that. I also love this forum. Like I love uh, the mm -hmm. video podcast kind of stuff. So um, trying to figure out a way not to make it too big for me either, mm -hmm. like to do it, like being a guest regularly on mm -hmm. different shows is a good way to get the information out there and talk about the issues. So trying to figure out what's next and um, find a good assistant and 
<laughs> and you're talking about an assistant probably on a lot of different levels of organization. Exactly. Yeah. You need a, you need an, an apprentice. So, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I need just something, um, someone to help. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and then, um, yeah, maybe it would be nice not to have to do it all myself, you know, to find mm -hmm. people I trust to do it with. Um, well, I'm a firm believer in um, articulating what you need. Yeah. And then, um, because you never know what the universe might provide. When exactly. it comes along, you can identify it. Yeah. And, you know, reach out and hang on to yeah. um, an offer or entertain an idea that could lead to exactly. that relationship. So I guess I'm going to say more funding as well. <laughs> <laughs> You're so fabulous and so deeply inspiring and generous. I, uh, I really want to thank you for joining us today. It's and, good and to see you. You too. Um, I'm, I try so hard. You know, it's such a weird uh, medium to connect, but uh, it's so nice to see faces and connect with yeah. people this way. Yeah. I want to invite, you know, anybody who's chosen to listen and join in on zoom to you know turn your camera on for a moment and and you know just like show your face um <laughs> here's looking at you holly oh <laughs> so cute oh i love yeah. it yeah and then of course there's always a bunch of people out there in um facebook land who are choosing to watch you know today that way and that's always a you know an option but i want to thank the supporters who choose to enter this more intimate space with us and especially you as our future yeah. guest. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry about the little glitch earlier. Yeah, we're yeah. here. Yeah, we are here. We made it. So thank you all. Yes, thanks, Asia. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Compelling conversations. Hi, Petra. Hi, yeah. Holly. So Hi, good to see you. You too. Hi, Rika. Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes. Yeah, your capacity to tap into like purpose oh. and positivity oh. is just oh. it's just exactly yeah. what um Sweet. fires my cylinders, you know. Oh, so, thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's how I feel now. I probably go walk the dogs and mope. <laughs> <laughs> walk the dogs and mope and then come home and take a nap. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we have to do those things too i know yeah, yeah. yeah. rest and yeah well have fun in california enjoy the sunshine if you yeah. get it just a few more days of it yeah yeah thank you thank you all so much thank you so much mm -hmm. thank you holly thank that you. was really fascinating oh thank so you good to see you guys so yeah. good to see you guys it's it's really a pleasure it's a delight to see you to see everyone each week and next week, we'll be back with Nina Elder. She's going to talk about the sort of learnings and gleanings from her residency as it winds up here at Bunnell Street Art Center, looking at worn objects. It, re it resonates so much with what you've been saying, Holly, because these objects are like ropes and things, so much like bodies that we depend upon, limbs, you know, that attach yes. or grasp the land or the net or the... So, um, She's got a beautiful project and she'll be speaking about that. Yeah, I think my hands are part of that project. So that'll be nice. Yes. yes. Oh! Yes. <laughs> well, take care, everybody. Be well. Yes. Thanks, and Asia. Stay in touch. Share ideas for who you want to talk with in this forum. Always open. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Bye bye. Wow. Wow. That was good.